Greetings everyone! In our previous video, we saw that the strength of a body is affected by two factors, material and geometry. Today, we'll examine one of these factors, geometry. How does geometry affect the strength of a body? Yes, we notice something, but how can we express this mathematically? Let's look at bookshelves made from a wooden board with a rectangular cross-section. The only difference is the board's orientation. In one, the board is laid flat. In the other, it is set on edge. Put the books on the left shelf. Under the load, the shelf will bend. It seems to have bent a bit too much. Now place the same books on the right shelf. It looks stiffer under the load. The boards have the same length and the load is applied at the same point. The effects such as the bending moment and the shear force are the same. So, how does this difference happen? Yes, placing the board on edge makes the shelf deflect less under this load. So, what effect causes this? This effect comes from the sections having different area moments of inertia. Now let's start at the very bottom and climb step by step to understand what the area moment of inertia means. Calculations will start with the assumption that the area of a 1 by 1 rectangle is 1 square unit. In this case, a rectangle with a width of 3 units and a height of 4 units has an area of 12 square units. This also means that the area of a rectangle with infinitesimal width delta x and height delta y equals delta x times delta y. In this case, the area of a complex cross-section is the sum of the areas of infinitesimal rectangles. If the boundary is defined by a function, then for each x, the rectangle's height is given by that function. Now the area of the section is the sum of the areas of rectangles with one side length known. Consider a triangle. First decide which axis makes it easier to write the rectangle's side length as a function. The area of a cross section is invariant and therefore independent of the axis. In this case, defining the function with respect to the y-axis is easier. By triangle similarity, we can obtain the function that gives side length of the rectangle. At a distance y from the chosen axis, the side length of the rectangle is proportional to the triangle's base width. In this case, the side length of the chosen rectangle at any point is determined by the triangle's height and base width. Now we can compute the area of the rectangle. The area of the triangle is the sum of the areas of these rectangles, and this sum is obtained by integration. When we substitute the given values for the triangle, we find that the area of this triangle is 10 square units. Now we will compute the area of a quarter circle. Since the boundary is circular, we will use polar coordinates. First we sum these rectangle areas from center to the radius, then we sum again over the full angle range. Consider a circular element at a distance r from the center and at an angle theta to the axis. Its sides are circular, but since it is infinitesimal, we will treat it as a rectangle. In this case, the arc length equals one side of the rectangle. Now we can compute the area of the rectangle. The area of the given section is obtained by summing these rectangle areas from the center to the radius and from zero to the angular limit. This is done by integration. Then we obtain the area of the quarter circle. With the numerical values substituted, the area is pi square units. Now we introduce the static moment of an area, also called the first moment of it. The area of a cross-section is invariant and does not depend on the coordinate system. The static moment, however, depends on the chosen axis and describes how the area is distributed about it. It is used to locate the centroid and to determine how shear stresses are distributed across the cross-section. The static moment of an area equals the sum over the entire section of each infinitesimal area multiplied by its perpendicular distance to the chosen axis. When the axis passes through the centroid, the areas below the axis have negative moment arms and the static moments of the areas above and below the axis sum to zero. We will use this relation to find the centroids of the cross sections. For example, consider a cross section with a complex shape. 
The static moment of area is zero about any axis through the centroid. Now choose an axis and shift it slightly. As the axis moves, the static moment appears, whose value equals the area times the perpendicular offset of the axis. Therefore, the centroid's distance to that axis equals the static moment divided by the area. To locate the centroid, we need at least two intersecting axes, so we write the same relation for another convenient axis. In this way, we determine the centroid from its distances to the chosen axis. Remember that the centroid is a fixed point and does not depend on the choice of axis. Therefore, in calculations, we can choose the axis in a way that simplifies the work. No matter which axis is chosen, the location of the centroid remains unchanged. Section symmetry is closely related to the centroid. If a section has a symmetry axis, the centroid lies on that axis. If there are two or more symmetry axes, the centroid is located at their intersection. The centroid does not have to lie within the section region. For example, in a hollow box section, the centroid may lie in the void, outside the boundary of the section. The geometric centroid is not the same as the center of gravity. They coincide when the material is homogeneous, or when its distribution follows the section's symmetry. Otherwise, they may differ. Let's calculate the vertical distance from the centroid of the triangle to the horizontal axis. Since we have already calculated its area, all we need to do is include in the integral expressions the distance of each infinitesimal element from the axis and the area we computed earlier. As the calculations are continued, perpendicular distance from the centroid to the chosen horizontal axis is one-third of the height. For cross-sections composed of simple shapes, we find the centroid by segmenting it into parts. The vertical line that divides the section exactly in half is a symmetry axis, and the centroid lies on it. To determine its exact position, let us choose an arbitrary axis and continue the calculation. Place our axis in the horizontal direction passing through the junction of the two parts. The static moment produced by the triangle is 18 cubic units, and for the square is negative 13.5 cubic units. Therefore, the total static moment of the section about the chosen axis is 4.5 cubic units. Dividing this value by the total area gives the centroid's distance from the axis as 0.25 units in the positive direction. We've arrived at a very important geometric property of the cross-section. The area moment of inertia, also called the second moment of area. The area moment of inertia effective is in loading cases that cause bending, such as simple bending, eccentric axial loading, and buckling. It also determines torsional behavior. As we see, the moment of inertia plays a critical role in all important loading cases. As its value increases, the stress levels within the cross-section begin to decrease and the body becomes less sensitive to loading. The area moment of inertia is the moment about the zero pressure axis produced by the hydrostatic pressure acting on a submerged area. We focus on the geometric part that is independent of the fluid's weight. Now we can compute the area moment of inertia of a rectangle about a chosen axis. It is found to be bh cubed over 12 about the centroidal horizontal axis and bh cubed over 3 about the axis through the base. Why is the area moment of inertia so critical in bending behavior? Similar to hydrostatic pressure, the normal stresses due to bending vary linearly across the cross section in the elastic range and are perpendicular to the surface. For any section with a known area moment of inertia, we will obtain the stress distribution without writing any equilibrium equations. The value of the area moment of inertia depends on the axis about which it is calculated. In engineering calculations, it is taken about the neutral axis, where the normal stresses due to bending are zero. For linear elastic homogeneous materials, the neutral axis always passes through the centroid. The area moment of inertia equals to the summation over the entire section of each infinitesimal area multiplied by the square of its perpendicular distance to the chosen axis, so its value is always greater than zero. 
To see how to use this generalization, let us repeat the calculation for the rectangular cross-section. By setting up the integral expressions, the area moment of inertia about the centroidal horizontal axis is bh cubed divided by 12. We now know the moment of inertia for any rectangle with respect to the horizontal axis passing through its centroid. But what if we need to calculate it with respect to another parallel axis? Do we have to set up the integral expressions again? No. This is where the parallel axis theorem comes into play. Moment of inertia can be transferred to another parallel axis using this theorem. All we need to do is multiply the area by the square of the distance between the two axes and add it to the moment of inertia calculated for the reference axis. Its value about the axis through the base can be easily found as bh cubed divided by 3. The parallel axis theorem also allows us to compute the area moment of inertia for complex geometries composed of simple shapes. The area moment of inertia of this I-shaped cross-section is obtained by calculating the moments of inertia of the rectangular areas about their own centroids and then transferring them to the axis of interest using the parallel axis theorem. When this is added to the moment of inertia of the rectangle labeled 2, the total moment of inertia of the I-shaped cross-sectional area is found to be 6,246 units to the power of 4. Alternatively, the same result can be obtained by taking the area moment of inertia of the large rectangle and subtracting those of the smaller rectangles. For a section with a circular hole using subtraction simplifies the calculations. As the area spreads farther from the neutral axis, the area moment of inertia increases. For this reason, hollow and open cross sections are often preferred in engineering designs. For example, the area of this I-shaped cross section is less than half of the large rectangle's area, but its area moment of inertia has decreased by only 25%. This is why such sections are used as main members in engineering designs. To use an area in the most efficient way, we must orient it correctly with respect to the load. To do this we need three quantities, the area moments of inertia about two perpendicular axes and the product of inertia. Different choices of origin lead to different results. In engineering practice the origin of the axes is placed at the centroid. In most cases, the neutral axis passes through this point. The product of inertia comes into play. We will use it to find the maximum and minimum moments of inertia of the area. It also helps us find how the area moment of inertia changes when the area is rotated. In other words, what its value is about inclined axes. Product of inertia of an area equals the summation over the entire section of each infinitesimal area multiplied by the perpendicular distances to the axis. It can be negative, positive, or zero. If at least one axis passes through an axis of symmetry, its value is zero. The axes for which the product of inertia is zero are the principal axes. Principal axes are nothing but the axes that give the maximum and minimum values of the area moment of inertia. Orienting this cross-sectional area perpendicular to the neutral axis gives the strongest orientation. In the horizontal orientation, the cross-section is in its weakest state. There is always a 90-degree angle difference between these two orientations. To find the product of inertia of this cross-section, first place the set of axes taking the centroid as the origin. For the rectangles, the product of inertia about the set of axes passing through their own centroids is zero. When this is transferred to the centroidal axis using the parallel axis theorem, the total product of inertia is obtained as 1575 units to the fourth power. Now we can compute the area moments of inertia about an inclined axis and determine the maximum and minimum values. If the angle of rotation is substituted into the formulas below, taking counterclockwise as positive, the values about the new set of axes are obtained. These are also the values that are obtained when the section is rotated in the opposite direction. Using these formulas, the angle values corresponding to the principal axes, as well as the maximum and minimum area moments of inertia values, can also be obtained. Instead of using these formulas, we can perform these computations more easily by using a graphical method called Moore's Circle.
We set up a Cartesian coordinate system with the origin at 0, 0, taking the horizontal axis as the area moment of inertia and the vertical axis as the product of inertia. Point A corresponds to the coordinates IX and IXY. Point B corresponds to the coordinates IY and negative IXY. The midpoint of these two points is the center of Moore's circle. The radius of the circle is equal to half of the distance between these two points. The points where the circle intersects the horizontal axis give the maximum and minimum area moments of inertia, that is, the principal values. We have already stated that there is always a 90 degree difference between these directions in the actual section. On Moore's circle, however, the angle between them appears as 180 degrees. The actual angles are half of the angles measured on Moore's circle. Let us now use Moore's circle to compute the maximum and minimum area moments of inertia for the given section. All we need to do is add and subtract the radius to the center coordinate. In this way, we obtain these principal values. Now, let us compute the angle of the principal axis with respect to the original axis. If we rotate the line segment corresponding to the x direction clockwise toward the side of the minimum area moment of inertia, we obtain the principal axis where the section is in its weakest orientation. The angle between these directions is computed using trigonometry. The actual angle in the physical section is half of this value and is equal to 25.286 degrees. Now let us examine the case where the axes are rotated 30 degrees counterclockwise. On Moore's circle, this corresponds to rotating the current set of axes 60 degrees counterclockwise. The angle that this new position makes with the horizontal axis is obtained by subtracting twice the principal axis angle that we computed earlier and 60 degrees from 180 degrees. By dropping a perpendicular and forming a right triangle, we can use trigonometry to obtain the area moments of inertia for the inclined axis. In the new set of axes, the product of inertia remains in the same region with respect to the horizontal axis as in the original state, so its sign is preserved. The area moment of inertia can also be computed about a point O in the plane. This is called the polar moment of inertia. It represents the geometric part of the resistance of successive cross-sections of a member subjected to torsion against separating from each other. It has the same properties as Cartesian area moments of inertia, such as the parallel axis theorem. If the area moments of inertia of a cross-section about a set of Cartesian axes passing through point O are known, no additional calculation is needed for the polar moment of inertia about O, it is simply their sum and it is independent of the rotation of the axis. We have now completed our discussion of the geometric properties that affect the strength of a body. If you find our content helpful, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Hope to see you in the next video. Stay happy.